Okay, um, respiratory. Respiratorio. Respiratory. Um, we are going to talk about respiratory and we're going to be talking about its anatomy first. Well, first we'll talk about its function. Obviously, there's a few functions in the lungs and in the, uh, the, and the, and the anatomy of the upper respiratory versus the lower respiratory tract. And they're divided, the upper respiratory and the lower respiratory. Okay, um, so uh, when we talk about the, uh, the upper respiratory, I want you to remember that it's the nasal pharynx, the nasal pharynx. We have the oral pharynx, which is in the mouth, the mouth and oral pharynx. And then we have the throat down here, which is the larynx or the pharynx, however you want to say it. The larynx or the pharynx? The larynx, the pharynx, or the larynx? These are the three areas of the throat. Now, uh, when we breathe, okay, we have these major bronchi that bifurcate into the right and left lung. Those are called bronchi. The, once it goes through the throat, it enters into the trachea. And the trachea is a very bony, bony place. It's very, very sturdy and very bony. Um, the, the, the cell type that is in the uh, um, lungs and in the bronchi are called columnar epithelium. They're columnar epithelium because not only do they have the cell of the columnar, they also have little hair-like structures on top and they also secrete mucus. So this is a columnar epithelium, okay? Um, the, uh, the upper respiratory tract is very moist. So that means that we have a lot of goblet cells. Goblet cells are cells that line up the inner, inner uh, 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 um, layers, which will secrete moisture, mucus, water, and, and make sure that the mouth and the throat and the bronchioles and the bronchiolars are moist. We need to keep it moist and mucusy and sticky because it's a protective mechanism. Remember, when we breathe in air, we're breathing in a lot of dust. And if you ever look at air, you'll see that. There's a lot of dust that goes in. And we can catch that all in those little mucousy surfaces. Some of it gets into the lungs, and we breathe it back out. But a lot of it gets stuck in the, in the uh, bronchiolars and the, and the major bronchus and the mouth and the, and the trachea because it's... It's, uh, uh, it's one of those protective mechanisms. And you know, viruses and bacteria that go into that area can get caught. And they get swallowed or they, they get coughed out. They don't get into the lungs. You understand that? And if you swallow it, like, <clears throat> and then you swallow, it goes into the stomach. So it dies from the acidity. You understand? So it's a kind of protective mechanism that we have. Not to mention, uh, in the immune system, what is the immune system that handles the, the uh, lungs? I intra, uh, immunoglobin A, IgA, remember lungs and digestion? So we have a little protection there. Also the macrophages are there for the, uh, for the um, to protect the, uh, the, the, the macrocytes of the, of, the, of the pulmonary system. Uh, they help protect us. Not to mention there's neutrophils everywhere, so in case you have a bacterial infection, the neutrophils come around. The viral infections, T cells, right? T cells take care of viruses. So, you know, we have a little, little protection there. It's a very vulnerable area. Remember, the, the viruses that are going on today are because of air droplets. It's how it's coming back at you when you inhale it. You understand that? That's how we're getting this, and it's very contagious because of that. Okay, anything that's air 
droplet or, or con communicating by, by, by uh, sneezing or by coughing. It's very hard to control these things. And that's why we have to quarantine people. And that's what we're doing now, right? Aren't we doing that now, kind of? And uh, so the concept of, of the oxygen and air going into our lungs has a protective mechanism of preventing us from getting all these, this debris that's going into our lungs and catches it. And remember that pollen and things that we're allergic to can also go into our lungs, right? Into our nasal passages. And the macrophages and the immune system attack that. And remember, allergies and asthma, what's, what's the immune system for that? IgE, right? Mast cells, right? In the lungs, right? You gotta remember all this. It comes back at you all the time. Immunology comes back at you all the time. Everything I say always comes back again, somewhere along the line. That's where you have to connect these dots. Immunology is part of the system of the whole body, so connect it. How digestive? What, what's protecting us there? Uh, you know, when we when we talk about blood, what's protecting us there? So remember that that you have to keep on thinking about things that I've talked about prior that connect into what I'm saying today. So um, uh, so the so the respiratory system has uh, breathes air and. Um, when we breathe air, what is in, uh, how much oxygen is in air, by the way? How much oxygen is in air? 21%, that's it. 21% of the air that we breathe in is oxygen. That's it. That's considered to be 100%. That's 100% oxygenation for me, or for you. Okay, and I'll show you how that works. Okay, so with the atmospheric pressure being 760 on the outside, the oxygen molecules are in this particular area right now because when I breathe in, I'm getting that amount of oxygen. That's the 21% that I'm talking about. As I get higher up in altitude, the number of the, of the 760 atmospheric pressure gets lower. So as I get higher, it goes from 760 to 740, to 730, to 720, to 700, and as it gets lower and lower, the pressure gets less and less, so the molecules spread out more and more. That's why we don't get as much oxygen as we go higher in altitude, because the oxygen molecules now are spreading out in a larger area, and so that breath of air that we normally do in the atmospheric pressure at 760, the same breath of air that we do at 700 will not be the same amount of oxygen that we're getting into our lungs. So instead of saying 21%, now it's at 19%. So we have a, so our body's not adjusting well to that. And we wind up getting a little ill and we get headaches. That's called altitude sickness. When you, when you don't breathe, when, you're, when you go higher up in the altitude and you don't feel well because the amount of oxygen that's going into your body is not as adequate as it was when you were here in atmospheric pressure, no, uh, uh, sea level. But we're actually, Miami's below sea level. So we're getting, you know, we have more pressure. So the oxygen that we're breathing in is more. But remember that as we get higher, oxygen is less because it disperses around the molecules that go into a wider space. So we, now we gotta breathe like that. And that's exactly what happens when we go in high altitudes. We start breathing heavier. We start breathing deep because we can't get the air. And we wind up getting a little sick from that. Okay, altitude sickness. It's, just, it's wise to acclimate yourself by not exercising so quickly when you go to these high altitudes. Let your body adjust to it. it you can survive. And there is a mechanism in your body, and I, want, I, I wonder if anyone can, and knows this. There's a mechanism in your body that when you have a low oxygen content that will increase red blood cell production and increase renin production because you have low oxygen. What is it? The kidneys. Mm -hmm. The kidneys will start to kick in, so what will happen is you will have a polycythemia if you have a constant low oxygen level. So you get what we call physiological polycythemia in high altitudes. You understand what I just said? Because the oxygen is lower in concentration as we go higher, 
the kidneys will kick in thinking that we don't have enough oxygen, giving us more red blood cell production, and that will in turn give us uh, the physiological polycythemia that is normal for people that live in high altitudes, not normal for people that live here in, 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 in normal altitude. If you have polycythemia at this level, then we have to investigate further because something else is causing it, not the hypoxia, you understand? But if you have asthma, if you have any kind of pulmonary disease, polycythemia would happen because you're not getting the oxygen, right? You understand that? Okay, so let's talk about the lungs a little bit. Uh, as we talk about the two lobes of the two lungs, uh, there are lobes. The right side has three lobes. The left side has two lobes. Uh, the left side has a cardiac notch for the heart to sit in, right? It's called the cardiac notch. Because remember, the heart is right here. The lungs are right here. Well, it interferes with the, with the left lung. So it kind of pushes a little indentation into it. So it's called the cardiac notch. Uh, on the right side, we have three lobes, and it's a superior, middle, and inferior lobe. The left side has a superior and inferior lobe. Uh, but there are actually nine segments to each of the lobes. And instead of saying uh, the, the, the lobes of the heart, we're going to be talking about the segments of the heart. And they're much more. It's almost like talking about the uh, abdomen and the quadrants versus the regions, right? There's four quadrants, nine regions of the abdomen. Well, there's, there's three lobes in the, in the left, in, in the right, two lobes in the left, but there are nine segments in each of them. And you understand that? So they're smaller areas. Okay. Um, the cell type in the, in the lungs, they're called adenocytes. They're called adenocytes. 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 Okay, uh, that's the cell. That's the type of cell that is the uh, the uh, the matrix of the entire lung. Adenocytes. Okay. Now there's also another two types of cells, and they're called pneumocytes. Pneumocytes. And there's type one and type two, and they are found in the alveoli of the of the lungs, and the alveoli are little bubbles and they look like packaging bubbles, and they look almost, I always use, them, use the analogy as, as, a, as grapes, as a vine of grapes. You know how the grapes look? They're all like a string of grapes, and that's how it looks inside the lung. Uh, 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 not as big as grapes, no, sometimes the grapes are really small, that's what they look like. They're not big grapes, they're small grapes, tiny grapes. And uh, they're little tiny bags, and they're very, very thin in their membrane around it, and they're very frail, and they open and close. They open and close as they inflate and deflate. You understand that? And they look like a party of, it almost looks, and it goes in a, in a sensual kind of a pop up. They all like open up together like a big wave of, a, of an ocean. You understand that? And it's usually in the bottom of the lungs that we're talking about. Remember that the, that the lungs have, a, have an apex and a base, right? Apex and a base. Not like the heart, which is the, the base is on top and the apex is on the bottom. Well, it, it's normal for everywhere else. <laughs> so uh, the apex and the base, and the base is what, is what um, expands. And we call that compliance, right? Like we do for the aorta when it opens up and, and recoils. Well, the lungs are the same way. They, they open up and they recoil just as much as the, as the arteries of the aorta would or dilate. You know, we call that compliance. Um, and uh, the, uh, the better your compliance, the, you know, the better your, your ventilation and your oxygenation and, and your respiration. So we're going to be talking about those kind of words, and we're going to also be talking about how they exchange gases to oxygenate the red blood cell, which is the job of the lungs, to oxygenate the red blood cell. They also have some other functions, like they do uh, have... Um, uh, remember, uh, renin coming from the kidneys goes to the liver to become angiotensin 1, and then they go to the lungs to become angiotensin 2 through an enzyme called ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme. So another function of the lungs is that it converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. 
because there's an enzyme found in the pneumocytes type 2 that will convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 through that particular enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme, which is a very, uh, very strong uh, vasoconstrictor. A, uh, angiotensin 2 is a very strong vasoconstrictor. So you need the lungs to do this, okay? Anyway, um, so uh, they also, one of the other functions of the, of the lungs is that uh, it makes surfactant, and that's in the alveoli as well with the pneumocytes type 2. And they will make surfactant. Surfactant is a liquid that prevents the collapse of the alveoli, and you can also just simplify it by not uh, by saying it, does, it prevents the collapse of the lungs, if you want to say it that way. You're not collapsing the lungs per se, but when those bags, those little tiny bags, inflate and deflate, when they deflate, they do not allow it to collapse. They allow it to inflate very easily, so it prevents them collapsing and touching those two sides. Because when a balloon is being blown up, when you first try to blow up a balloon, you're giving it this very hard pressure. And then it's easier, right? And it opens up very easily, right? Has anyone here not blown up a balloon before? So as you let it, the air out, if you don't let it out all the way, it's easier to, back, to inflate it back to its original size, right? So if, as long as you don't let all the air out, but once you let all the air out, then you gotta start from the beginning. And, let, and, and blow it up very hard. That's what surfactant does for the lungs. It doesn't allow the lungs to deflate all the way so that you can, incre you can actually passively breathe now without having to pop them back open again. And they always do this. And whenever you have that problem of, not, of, of, these, of these bags collapsing, these alveoli collapsing, then you have something wrong with your lungs. Uh, something that washed away because this surfactant is a fluid in your in, in inside of this little bubble, so something can wash it away, like uh, 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 like pneumonia, like because there's fluid in the lungs that will wash it away. So you'll have to these 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 alveoli collapse. And the classic story of putting your stethoscope to the chest and listening to the lungs when the surfactant is in a deficit or when you have pneumonia or anything that creates fluid in your lung, you'll hear popping and we call it crackles. Like they're all popping out like, like cereal and milk. Pop, 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 pop. You hear that cracking sound? That's what you hear. It's a popping sound. It's called crackles. And if you hear ronchi, that means you're hearing a sound with it. With a pop, 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 pop. You understand? So it's beginning. It has a both. Uh, both sounds are going on. You understand? So there's uh, there's ronchi and there's crackles, and uh, both have a significant um, uh, meaning to a a a, a a a a clinician that's listening to the lungs. Okay. Um, and then there's the sound of a wheeze, expiratory wheezing. Well, that's another explanation of a of a of a pathology of asthma. Where the where the um, where the uh, you're not you're not able to get CO2 out of your out of your breath you're you're constricted so it's called expiratory wheezing <laughs> you're breathing fine in but you can't breathe out and that's an, uh, that's another pathology we're going to be talking about and we'll talking and we'll talk about that in a moment okay so uh, the concept of the lungs is very simple. It doesn't. It it does doesn't do a lot, but it does enough. Okay, it does enough. So uh, the major uh, purpose of the lungs. Let's get into it. The um, the red blood cell, and the red blood cell is a uh, cell that's only job is to carry oxygen and to deliver it to muscles and pick up CO two, or deliver it to any place in the body and pick up CO2 because every living thing needs oxygen. So blood is going everywhere. I don't care where it's at, if the cell is alive, it's going to get oxygen. That means a nerve, an artery in the nerve is going there. An artery in the vein is going there. I don't care where it's at. There has to be an artery in a vein, okay? Nerves are also there as well, 
Uh, and, and there are also lymphatics that are there. And we discussed lymphatics before, right? How the lymphatic system picks up all interstitial uh, 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 excess fluid from the sweating of the arteries and veins, right? The accumulation of, of fluid. And it's usually a, a clear plasma type fluid. It's not blood. It's the plasma that's leaking out. So we have to pick that up, right? You remember all that concept about the lymphatics? There's always a lymphatic system where there's an artery and a vein, and there's always a nerve where there's an artery, a vein, and a lymphatic. Except in the brain. The brain's one of the exceptions of the rule where there's uh, where the uh, there's no pain receptors in the brain themselves. It's pretty amazing. Okay, so the red blood cell uh, picks up CO2. I mean, uh, picks up CO2, and uh, uh, it. Um, well, let's just stop in the beginning. It picks up O2, right? And it's and it uh, goes to the um, goes to the uh, 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 place where it needs to deliver the oxygen to, right? And it delivers the oxygen and it picks up CO2, right? And there is a uh, something I must talk about uh, when a when a red blood cell picks up CO2. It's an acid. CO2 is an acid. The red blood cell can't handle acid. It can't handle it. So it must convert it to something else so it can work, so we can hold on to it. So with an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, the CO2 becomes H2CO3. This is a bicarbonate, and this will <clears throat> temper the control of the carrying system so that it can deliver it to the lungs. Because if it's acidic and it's carrying it, it's going to burn. Red blood cells are very fragile. They're very fragile uh, uh, cells. By the way, do they have a nucleus? No, right? They don't have a nucleus. <coughs> One of the few cells that do not have a nucleus. So when the CO2 gets picked up, it takes it to CH2CO3, which is a bicarb. And then when it goes to the lungs, it sends it back to CO2 through the same mechanism of carbonic anhydrase. And then we blow it out. Okay? Now let me ask you a question. When we blow out stuff, when we blow it out, when we exhale, is there oxygen in that? Yes. How much oxygen? I must have talked to you guys before. Huh? Yeah. yeah. There is oxygen when we blow out. And the concept is CPR, right? If we're blowing into a person's mouth, it better be something that they can use. And it's not your tongue. You know what I mean. <laughs> so, the red blood cell, by the way, are, are made by the bone marrow, right? Urethropoietin is the hormone secreted by the kidneys that sense low oxygen, all right? Or they sense anemia. If you have a low red blood cell count, your reticulocyte count must be high. Reticulocyte. Reticu reticulocyte. Reticulocytes are the young red blood cell. Before they become a urethrocyte, they must become a reticulocyte first. There's a whole pathway for it. This is right before it becomes mature. Okay, when the bone marrow is making red blood cells, there's a whole pathway that goes up about seven steps until it gets to the reticulocyte. When the reticulocyte goes into the blood, we can measure it and we can see if your blood, if the red blood cells are being made, if you are anemic, right? Or if you're polycythemic, which is the opposite. Remember, anemia means low red blood cells, polycythemia means high red blood cells. You understand? So uh, when we look at the reticulocyte count, which is usually at 1%, if it goes to 3% and you're anemic, that's normal. It's supposed to be making more red blood cells, right? But if you're anemic and you're still at 1%, then something's wrong. You're not making red blood cells. And one of the major reasons why that could happen is because you, don't, you have a low iron level. 
Sometimes low iron can cause you not to make red blood cells. Because remember, iron is the building block of a hemoglobin molecule. Remember that? Remember the four branches of the hemoglobin molecule? All with O2, 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 O2. This is a fully saturated red blood cell, right? And when it's desaturated or, or, or deoxygenated, it looks like this. That's in the veins, right? This is in the arteries. Fully saturated veins. Arteries, veins. <laughs> you understand? Simple. You gotta understand this. Sometimes, exercise. Right? Simple. When you're breathing too hard and your heart rate's going fast, oxygen demand is high. Right? Do some squats. Heart rate will go higher. Breathing will be deeper. Simple to me. It's the person that has a heart rate that goes like this, and they're breathing like this when they're standing there. That's a problem. <laughs> now we have a little bit of a problem because now sympathetic nervous system is kicking in, right? Right? Remember I told you you can speed up your heart without moving? How do you do it? Sympathetic nervous system can make this go higher, right? And, right, you're scared. You're not moving, but you're scared. That makes you, that makes the heart rate go faster, right? So, you know, there's other methods of doing that. Anyway, um, so, uh, the upper respiratory system is consists of the nasopharynx, oropharynx, the larynx, and the bronchi. Before it actually gets inside the lungs, per se, right? We want to understand the upper respiratory system versus the lower respiratory system. When everything, when things are upper respiratory system, that's more like the bronchitis that we get, because it's right outside the lungs. Bronchitis is upper respiratory, per se, right? Any kind of allergies or any kind of nasal congestions, upper respiratory tract infections, okay? Uh, but when we get to the lower respiratory tract, then we're talking about the parenchyma, where the actual guts of the lungs are, where the alveoli are. And this is when we get into more trouble with colds and with the virus that we're, that's going around now. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lower respiratory tract. It's, it's getting into the lungs, okay? And that's why we get hurt, because remember that when fluid gets into our lungs, we have to be able to caulk this out. We have to be able to uh, 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 and, uh, move the fluid that's going on in the lungs. And when we don't do that, it ferments. And then it gets infection. And then you get sepsis. And then you die. Do you understand? This is how old people die. This is how the elderly die. They can't do this. <coughs> they can't do that. They, <coughs> they do that. Because they have no strength. It happens with young people too, don't get me wrong, but young people have a way of recovering faster because they just better, their immune system is stronger. They're, they're you know, so they're young, and when you're young, you can recover better, and that's really what it's all about. If anything that was out there that was killing young people, we'd be in, in, in a tragic situation, you know, where they would be killing old people also. Believe me, if it kills the young, it's definitely gonna kill the old, <laughs> you know that. So um, for right now, that, that virus is killing mostly the elderly and the very young and people with pulmonary problems. And if you have asthma, if you have bronchitis, you have, if you have bronchial asthmatics that get sick when they get a cold and they get bronchitis from it, well, you know, these are the people that we have to watch for. And, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, it's not that uh, we're, uh, we're, we're panicking right now, even though the stock market is panicking. But we have to kind of understand that by keeping yourself, by not touching your face, is the key to not spreading it. You can't touch your face. Stop touching your face. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I'll touch your face. And use this stuff. Prell. 
But and this is a question about the virus itself. So yes. Do you find it more concerning about how fast it spreads rather than? Oh yes, that's the whole key to it. It's how fast it's going. The 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 aggressor, the aggressiveness of it, how it's getting from one person to another very easily. It's a scary thing. But remember, influenza virus kills a couple of thousand people a year. But you know, so this coronavirus is something that we have to kind of deal with because it's an unknown. It's unknown to us right now. What's going on? <laughs> it's kind of scary. I'm taking some precautions. You have to take some precautions. Don't pick your nose, don't rub your eyes. You know, don't do things that are that you know that little children do. Try to keep your face away. That's why animals don't get sick. They don't they can't touch their face. They can't get that. They, they can't get that. We get that. The ultimate weapon. Mm -hmm. This is the weapon. This is what the virus is wanting you to do. Do that. Bad. Anyway, um, so here are two lungs. And by the way, the right lung, the right lung has a shorter bronchus than the left lung. The right lung has a shorter bronchus than the left lung, which means that most of the time, if you get something in your lungs accidentally with food, it's going to go into the right lung, 90% of the time. It's going to be in your right middle lobe. That's where it goes. When you aspirate, and it goes into your lungs, because the left lung is long. So look at this short little space that's going into it. It can get in there. It gets there much easier. If it's in the left side, it goes up to here. It's not in the lung. You understand that? So just remember that. And every time you cough, <coughs> you're moving things about an inch. Every time you cough, you're moving things up about an inch. So when you're having to get something inside your lungs, I can tell the cough versus here versus here. Right? So the cough of a of a post nasal drip. I gotta drink something to do this. A cough. You ready for the cough? <clears throat> That's post nasal drip. <clears throat> post nasal drip, right? You can tell that. Bronchitis. <coughs> right here. Here, <laughs> you understand the difference? It's all about where it's coming from. We're trying to get the fluid out here, we're trying to get the fluid out here, or we're trying to get the fluid out here. So there's a different cough. You get that? So um, understanding those, those things, concepts, um, we're gonna go into the lungs themselves. Now, we already talked about the trachea. By the way, the trachea, and this is squamous cell right here squamous cell. When it gets into the lungs here, it changes to columnar epithelium, which is the, which is the uh, goblet cells. There's a squamous epithelium right here, right where the trachea and the bifurcation of the bronchils are, bronchi are, and um, then it changes to the columnar epithelium because it's sweatier. It's more fluid-like. And we want to trap, and by the way, there's cilia there. So they weigh, sway back and forth. They catch things. That's what we want. It's protective mechanism. When you get a virus here, those, those cilia freeze up. That's how they get, they freeze up when you get a virus and they don't sway back and forth. That's why you keep on itching, you keep on coughing, it get, it, it's irritated, you keep on sp spitting out mucus. And bacteria is even worse because that one gives you a pus-like uh, uh, mucus. You understand that? When you cough up fl uh, phlegm that's very f frothy, it's viral. But when it comes out green, it comes out, starts turning colors, then it's starting to become bacterial. You understand that? You can get a bacterial infection from that. That's not always true, but it's for the most part that's true. And I like to give antibiotics, even for viral medication, even for viral uh, pneumonias, because they can develop into bacterial pneumonias. You understand that? They're vulnerable for it, so I might as well give them something that will help that out. And it will, and um, the antiviral medications today 
for the flu are being used for the corona because it kind of actually does the same thing. The, the viruses that affect you with the flu enter into cells before they can affect you. Well, that's all viruses. All viruses have to enter into a cell to, to affect you. Well, there's antiviral medications, and they can work a little bit depending on the on the virus. The flu, it works. We we give the we give the we give the uh, the vaccine, and we also give the 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 antiviral. About a, about three days before the virus hits, you can take antivirals, and it can actually stop the process. You can get a very mild cold. But um, uh, we're trying to do it for the corona now. I, I'm I'm pretty sure that the virus. The, the antiviral medications are going to just be tweaked a little bit, and they can be used to help Corona not to become so virulent and so and so uh, so so dangerous. You understand? Uh, so uh, so we get into the lungs themselves, and remember when these bronchi go in and they become bronchiolars, and then they become interlobular bronchiolars, and then when they get to the alveoli themselves, which is what I'm going to draw right now. And this is where it gets important. Okay? This is the alveoli. At the end, between all of that bronchiolars, there are two areas right here that you have to remember. The terminal bronchiolars and the respiratory bronchiolars. This is the area by which has no integrity. In other words, their tube is very flimsy, and it opens up when we breathe out, and it kind of has stress so when we breathe. When we breathe in, it opens up to so open up for air, and then when you breathe out, it kind of constricts a little bit. You understand that? This is where asthma comes into effect, because what happens is this area constricts so much that it can't get the air out. This is the area. The respiratory and the terminal bronchiolars touch each other when they breathe out. And they don't have any integrity there. That's why we need to treat them with something that's going to dilate them. So we give them albuterol. The beta-2 receptor agonist dilates it. Dilate. It dilates the whole lung, by the way. It opens up the whole lung. And it dilates it so it makes them normal again. It's the rescue. You know the rescue breather? You know the, about that albuterol, right? It's in, the, it's in the inhaler. And you have an asthmatic attack. It stops the wheezing. It bronchodilates immediately. It's an immediate reaction. It's good. It's a good thing. Don't use it too much. It's for the rescue. If you use it every day, you need something else besides that. In other words, you need more medications. If you need this every day and you're using the albuterol all the time, then you need to get another medication because the episodes are happening too much. So we need to get stronger medication, longer lasting medication, like steroids. Like steroids. Steroids are longer lasting. So they keep inside, so they don't allow the, the, uh, the, uh, the effect of the asthma to affect you all the time. You understand? You're breathing, uh, so, so, let's, so, now we can talk about the vein and the artery, right? And then the capillary. This is the capillary. Now, in real life, this is really wrapping around the, it's really wrapping around like this. I'm just spreading this out to make you see what happens, okay? But the capillary system wraps around the alveoli bubble like a, like a spider web would wrap around it. You understand? It wraps around it. Because what is the capillaries for? What is the purpose of capillaries? Gas exchange. Gas exchange. That's what's going on. That's what we need to do. So here we go. Let me draw this again so it's nice and clear for you. Okay, so this is the bubble. Right? We're going to be breathing in. We're going to be breathing in. So we're breathing in, right? So here's your box for breathing in, right there. It's going to be 100% O2 and 40% CO2. That's the number I want you to remember. 
for inhaled air. And remember, the 21% oxygen is considered the 100%. You understand? I'm using it as 100% to make things clear to you. You understand me? But it's really 21% oxygen. But I'm using it as 100% because that's what it is. So as we're breathing in, this is the box. 100% O2, CO2 is 40%. Okay? Now, this membrane is very thin. This is a membrane, it's epithelial cells, it's epithelial cells, very thin. And it's semi-permeable, which means gases can go through it. You understand? It's almost like, a, like when, you're, when, you're, when you're, you have that cloth that you can breathe through, you can breathe through it. That's the semi-permeability of it, you know? It's allowing oxygen to go through. And that's what this thing does. And the red blood cell that's going to be traveling through here on the, in the vein area, this, its number is going to be 40% O2 and 45% CO2. This is in the vein. This is considered deoxygenated blood. So everybody pay attention to these numbers. So the veins are 45% CO2 and 40% O2 because it's deoxygenated. It's not at zero. I want you to see that. Our oxygen in our deoxygenated blood is not at zero. That's why when we do CPR, what's the most important thing? Compressions. We're trying to move the red blood cell. Even though it's not getting air, the oxygen in red blood cells has still enough to oxygenate tissue. So you can keep the guy alive for a little while before the cavalry come to give him the oxygen. So compressions are important. Remember, the red blood cell is the most abundant cell in the body. It'll take you a long time to get all the blood through to get it all deoxygenated to zero. Believe me, it takes a long time. So you have enough time to compress and just go through that process of compressions and two breaths, which is the 7% that you're breathing out. Remember that? Remember, I'm breathing out 7% oxygen. I'm not using the whole thing because 40% is already in, uh, attached to the hemoglobin. All I need to do is supplement 60% of that. So I'm only using 60% of that 21% that I'm breathing in. So about 7% will breathe out. You understand that, right? It only needs, it only needs a little bit to fill it up to the top. It's only halfway empty or half full. So you need to just fill it up all the way again. It's like refilling a glass of water. You don't need the whole thing to be refilled. That's why the numbers here and the numbers here are going to exchange based on concentration gradient. So in other words, what's in the vein and now the capillary system here. And remember, the red blood cell is, has an affinity for oxygen that's 1,000%. In other words, if, it's, if it needs oxygen, it's going to grab it. So the, when it passes by this alveoli, it's going to actually take it, and the mag, almost like a magnet, and fill up its cup, filled with oxygen. So it's going to come across this, and it's going to go through the membrane, and it's going to take 100% of the oxygen. So the oxygen in the artery is going to be O2 of 100%, right? What's left out of that 100%? 40%, right? So 40% O2 is left in the alveoli, right? Because it only took the 60% that it needed to make it 100%. Is that understood? Is everybody clear on that? And then the 40%, 45% of the O2, well, the, 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 the red blood cell gives that to the alveoli because it, it, needs to, it needs to replace it with the O2. So it pushes the CO2 into the alveoli. So now the 45% is here for the CO2, and the CO2 here would be 40%. So this is oxygenated blood. 100% O2, the CO2 is 40%. This is oxygenated blood. Only 5% difference in the CO2, which is all it needs to control the acidity of the blood, which is 7.4 pH, right? The pH of the blood is 7.4. By regulating 5%, breathing in and out, 
we can maintain that 7.4. Do you understand me? See, remember, CO2 is acidic. It needs to leave the body. But we retain some of it because we need to keep the acidity of the blood at 7.4. Right? And this is what we exhale. The 40% O2 and the 45% CO2. This is what we exhale. Do you understand what just happened here, guys? This is how we breathe. This is why we fill up our alveoli with oxygen, so that it can deliver oxygen to the red blood cell that's passing by. And there are millions of them, millions of them, that are passing by every few seconds. And they're always being oxygenated because we are breathing. Right? We're delivering the oxygen to the lungs so that the lungs can just give it to the, give it to the red blood cell. And then the red blood cell gives it to the, uh, to the tissue. And then it comes back and we breathe out the CO2, the waste product. And then collects the CO2 again. Do you understand this exchange? You, you have to understand this exchange now. The numbers are very clear. What we breathe in, what we're breathing out, so we're actually doing this. If you want to watch and see this, we're doing the crisscross. The veins are going to the alveoli, and we're spitting it out. The inhaled air is going to the artery, and it's, go and it's taking it to the, to the circulation. So it's almost like we're doing the crisscross with it. They're going in this direction, going in that direction. What we inhale is going to the artery. What we exhale is going from the veins to the alveoli and out our mouth. Is that understood? So it's a very easy concept to understand. This is not complicated at all. I'm giving it to you now. It gets complicated. This can get very complicated, but we don't want to get it complicated. We want to simplify this in a concept that you understand so that you can read. You, you can read and see how it really works and how the semi-permeable membrane works. Now, there can be problems here, right? First of all, the surfactant is there to protect it from collapsing, right? And we also have uh, uh, the air going through very, very nicely, right? Remember, when you have bronchitis, it's a problem breathing in and out because the, bron the bronchioles are filled with mucus. So you have problems breathing in and out, right? We call the, bronchi the bronchitis the blue bloater because he, he doesn't get enough oxygen. So we call them blue bloaters because they get blue when it's chronic. And we call the asthma patient a pink puffer because they can breathe in, they can't just can't breathe out. So they have full of, they're like, they're oxygenated like this. They have all the oxygen they need, but they can't breathe it out, they can't breathe out the CO2. See, the oxygen is not the problem, it's the CO2 that's the problem. You understand that? And we have a pneumotactic center in our brain which causes us to breathe. How many times do you breathe per minute? 10 to 20 times per minute. That's normal breathing, right? Well, when you're sleeping, is it faster or slower? Well, during REM sleep, it's, you know, you're dreaming. Oh, oh, please help me. You know, that kind of breathing. But when you're going through a delta sleep, that's the deep sleep. And that's the sleep where you're at five times per minute. That's all I'm well, the brain stem doesn't allow you to die. There's a pneumotactic center in the brain stem, in the medulla and the pons, that sense low oxygen. I'm sorry, that sense high CO2. They sense the high CO2 levels, and they force you to, to breathe. I hear that um, sometimes when we're sneaking, and they, we feel like we're feeling from the bed or something. It's, it's well, that's the delta sleep. Uh, when you, that's the sleepwalking time. That's the kid that has his night terrors. This is the delta. They don't remember. You don't remember delta. You're in oblivion. That's the death zone. You're right there at the death zone. That's the anesthesia that you get from a surgery. They put you in the delta sleep. You're in a coma. It's that part. It's only about, it's a very short time when you're sleeping. It's only about maybe uh, an hour or two that you're in this, in this delta sleep. I have an eight hour sleep, let's say. Uh, but uh, you don't, uh, the delta sleep is not rest. REM sleep is the rest. When you get REM sleep, that's the best sleep, because you dream and you rest. 
I don't know why that's true. Because if I if it were up to me, I'd be Delta all day. Michael Jackson put himself in that uh, pro, pro football, uh medication that put him in Delta sleep. He was getting rest. He was in Delta sleep, but that's the death zone. You can you get into trouble when you get into that if you go too high with that dose, and that's what happened to him. He went into oblivion. He didn't know what happened. He went into oblivion. Just floated away. He didn't feel a thing. There was nothing wrong with Michael Jackson. He just couldn't sleep. You know? And he just took that stuff thinking that that was the best. It's not. You don't take that stuff to sleep. You know? Smoke a little uh, bagunji. <laughs> That's what they say. The, the med medical marijuana helps you sleep. It does. Anyway, does everybody understand this concept? Good. Because this is what breathing is all about. Now remember, um, inspiration, remember the apex of the lungs don't move. They don't expand. The bottom of the lungs, the, 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 the base of the lungs, are the lungs that expand and recoil. The top of the lungs are always inflated with air. Can you believe that? The tops of your lungs are always inflated. They don't deflate or inflate. And there's only certain times when they will. Probably when you're exercising a lot, when you're running, or you're going through a lot of uh, 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 um, uh, um, oxygen demand exercising, sometimes that top of the lung can move a little bit, but it's very stiff. Whereas the bottom of the lung is very, is, is very flexible. It moves. Now, the, the muscles of breathing are the diaphragm, the intercoastals, uh, uh, um, external and internal, and the pectoralis minor, and when you have deeper breathing, the pectoralis major and the sternocleomastoid are get involved as well. Okay? There are other tinier muscles that deal, that deal with breathing when you're deep breathing. But um, the, the uh, diaphragm, which is the essential for breathing, uh, has a nerve that innervates it. It's called the right. phrenic nerve. And it's from C2, C3, 4, and 5. C3, 4, and 5 keep the diaphragm alive. C3, 4, and 5 keep the diaphragm alive. That means that it comes out of the cervical area of the spine. The C3, 4, and 5 create the phrenic nerve, and that will spark you from breathing. And, what, and how it works is this. This is the diaphragm. These are your lungs. What happens is when it contracts, the diaphragm gets lower like this. It gets lower, like this. It contracts, and these elongate. So the diaphragm elongates the lungs to make to make more to make it easier to passively breathe in. You understand that? Without the diaphragm, you can't breathe. You can't breathe without the diaphragm. You cannot breathe without the diaphragm. It's essential that the diaphragm works for you to be able to breathe properly, because otherwise you cannot breathe. And this, it's called the bread basket. When you punch somebody right there in the bread basket, uh, 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 they can't breathe. Spasms. Your hiccups. Where's that from? The diaphragm. Diaphragm. Uh, don't. Uh, I won't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I wind up hiccuping for uh, for 90 days. By the way, hiccups more than 24 hours, you gotta go to the emergency room. You're not supposed to hiccup for more than more than a few hours. Why do they even happen? What's that? Why do they even happen? It's spasms of the muscle. It's a spasm of the muscle. It's a spasm. <coughs> Stop making me do it. I didn't make you do it. <laughs> I'm going to pick up an old day. Okay, so the diaphragm, remember the older muscles that control breathing. Now there's the medulla and the pons in the brain, which keep you alive. That, that's the area that keeps you alive so that you don't die at night and you won't wake up dead. Because when you breathe very slowly, CO2 levels increase, they sense that, and then you, it forces you to breathe. You understand that? Uh, when someone dies and, they, uh, and they're, uh, they're, brain, they're brain dead, but, they're, but their brain stem's still alive, they breathe like this. They take about five minutes to breathe again, and they're like this, and they breathe, and they're sitting in their hospital bed, and then we, we keep them alive, or we just go through, you know, we just, they're just dying right now, and they breathe like this. 
They don't breathe, and all of a sudden they go, <sighs> like that. This is, this is brain death. This is not a good sign. It's called agonal breathing in some cases. Agonal breathing, where the, where the CO2 levels, when a person's having a heart attack and their heart stops, and they go like this. They do that because they're not breathing, and this, the, the, the brain stem's making them breathe, but it's not normal breathing. You understand? It's called agonal breathing. So, um, so there's certain things that you should know about those are TF, FYIs. Okay, um, now, um, I was just going to talk about something that's very important. Uh, Okay, so there is a uh, chart for breathing. There is a chart for breathing. And we use this chart to measure lungs and their air that goes in. This is, this is the entire lung. The entire lung is what we call total lung capacity. Now the rule is more than one volume equals a capacity. If I add more than one volume to the equation, it's going to be called a capacity. Okay? Just remember that. This entire lung, this is the lung, 7,000 milliliters of air go in. Or you can say seven liters. But let's say 7,000 milliliters, okay? This is the amount of air that we breathe in like this. Now that can differ based on your size. Sometimes it can be six liters or 6,000 milliliters, depending on the size of the person, right? Infants are more like four liters, they're tiny. But the normal adult is about seven, okay? It's full expansion of the lungs, seven, 7,000 milliliters. This in the center right here is what we call tidal volume. Tidal volume. This is normal breathing at 10 to 20 per minute, right? That's about 500 milliliters. And then we have something on the bottom here called the residual volume. Residual volume. This is what's left in the lung every time I'm doing uh, uh, I'm letting all the air out of my lungs, but I can't get it all out, and this is what's left. It's called the residual volume. That's about 500 milliliters. That's about 500. Now, this is, these are very approximate numbers. I'm just giving you the concept of what's going on in the lungs. Okay? So we got residual volume. We have tidal volume. And we have total lung capacity, right? And total lung capacity is the entire thing, the entire lung. And each one of these other volumes are going to be separate in their own function. You understand that, right? So we have inspiratory volume, which starts from the top of the uh, tidal volume and up to the top of your capacity. So we call that inspiratory volume. Inspiratory volume. If we, if we start from the bottom of, the, of tidal volume and go up to the top, then we call that inspiratory capacity because it's more than one volume. You understand that, right? You understand this, right? More than one volume is a capacity. If I start from the top of the residual volume and I go to the bottom of the tidal volume, that's expiratory reserve volume. And if I include the reserve volume with the, actually wait, if I, yes, if I do the reserve volume at the bottom and I go all the way to the top of the 
of the tidal volume, that's, that's called expiratory functional capacity. Capacity. Now, watch this. If I include everything from here, the top, all the way down to, the, to, to where it doesn't go into the reserve volume, <clears throat> except the reserve volume, it's called vital capacity. It's everything except the reserve volume. Is that understood? This is the and, and and the numbers differ based on how much you inhale and how much you exhale, but it all comes out to be seven thousand milliliters. This is probably like thirty five hundred. This is oh, no, this is twenty five hundred. This is thirty five hundred. Okay, so in other words, the numbers can change based on your ability to expand the lungs and recoil them. Okay. But this is about 500, which is normal for everyday breathing, 10 to 20 per minute. Is that understood? This is the, this is the breathing chart. How the lungs work. When you get an anesthesia, remember, when you get an anesthesia and when you take pain medications, this hampers the, uh, the phrenic nerve from working. And it doesn't allow you to breathe well. That's why people can overdose with heroin. Heroin's a barbiturate, just like painkillers. Oxycodone works the same way. It numbs out the pain medicate with the nerves so that you don't feel anything. It also dysfunctions them so that you can't breathe. So when you overdose on a, on a drug, like a barbiturate, you're gonna suffocate. That's what happens. You just die of suffocation because you can't breathe. That's why you die. When you take something that's too much, the, the amphetamine, you get the heart attack, the, uh, the arrhythmia, <laughs> yeah. the stroke, whatever the case might be, because you're increasing activity of the, of the, of the, uh, of the uh, heart, and you're also vasoconstricting the arteries. So then a lot of the other things can happen as well, how you die. You understand this, right? So uh, understanding this is very important, understanding this concept, of, of, uh, of the chart, very important to understand. So remember, more than one volume equals a capacity. So when we have all the capacities, and we fool around with this, we say like total lung capacity equals uh, um, uh, Vital capacity plus residual volume. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Right? So that's how we can do it. We can say uh, vital capacity equals total lung capacity minus reserve volume. Isn't that true? So we fool around with the, with the, with the equation and we figure out numbers. This is what we do. You understand? And that can get very complicated. That's why pulmonologists are very smart people. They're very smart. They know what they're doing. The numbers are important to them. Or when they put in oxygen and they want to force air into your, into your lungs, they've got to have the numbers right because they can blow up those lungs. If you put too much force in the, into inhaling, you can blow up those lungs. So it's very important to understand that pulmonologists need to hear numbers and need to understand the disease process. Pulmonologists, they're very smart. Okay, um, now, <clears throat> when, remember the concept of when there's hypoxia, what kicks in? The kidneys, right? The kidneys kick in, right? But there's something I need to talk to you about. When you have an increase of CO2 levels in your lung, in your blood, because you cannot breathe out, that's called respiratory acidosis. Respiratory acidosis. When you are retaining CO2, for whatever reason it is, 
It's called respiratory acidosis because you're not allowing the CO2 to leave. CO2 is an acid. That makes sense, right? <clears throat> if I'm breathing too fast, like hyperventilation, well, that's going to be called respiratory alkalosis. Because now I'm releasing too much CO2, and the, and the pH of the blood will now go from 7.4 to 7.5. Instead of acidosis, it will be from 7.4 to 7.3, or 7.2. That's acidosis. This is acidosis. If it's alkalosis, it's 7.5, 7.6. You understand? I'm blowing out too much CO2. When this happens in a chronic way, like in other words, you're always, this is always the situation with you, but so for whatever reason it is, the kidneys kick in. The kidneys are smart, but they don't know why. This is, the, uh, this is the, how I always see the kidneys. The kidneys are smart, but they don't know why. They sense that there is too much CO2. It's too acidic. So what they are going to do is they are going, the kidneys are going to spill out hydrogen to compensate for the high CO2. Because remember, hydrogens are acidic also. So when we deal with the lungs, it's CO2. When we deal with the kidneys, it's hydrogens. So what happens is the kidneys kick in, and now your urine is going to be acidic, which is okay. But it's trying to compensate for what's going on in your body. So if the opposite is true, and you're breathing too much CO2 out, and you're becoming alkaline, then the kidneys are going to kick in and retain hydrogens, so that it balances out the, the pH of the blood. You understand that? But it never gets it to normal. So if you have an acidic environment of 7.2, well, it's going to try to get it to 7.3. It can, it's very rare that you can get it back to 7.4. The body can't get it to normal, but it can get it close to normal, so that it can you can you can you can live comfortably. You understand that? But the kidneys have to work. And remember, if the if the kidneys are dying or the is kidney failure, that means it's going to retain hydrogens, right? So it's going to be metabolic acidosis, right? Because they are now retaining the hydrogens, right? And if they're spilling out the hydrogens, what would that be called? Metabolic alkalosis. So when we talk about the lungs, we talk about respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. But when the kidneys are kicking in, they will do the opposite to compensate for what's going on. You understand that? So if the, resp so if the lungs are respiratory acidosis, what's the kidneys going to be? Metabolic alkalosis. They're going to spill out the hydrogens and cause that balance to go back to normal. If the lungs are respiratory alkalosis, what's the, what's the kidneys going to do? Metabolic acidosis. They're going to retain the acid in your body. You understand this? They work hand in hand. They are inversely related to each other. They will do the opposite to make sure that, the, that we're keeping up with everything. You follow me? That even though the kidneys are sensing all this and they're very smart, they don't know why they're smart. They just see that there's acidosis. They're just going to spill out hydrogens, and, this, and that's the way it's going to be. You understand that, right? Remember, the, the two areas of the body that, that sense, the, the one area that senses high CO2 levels is the brain stem. The area that senses low oxygen is the kidneys. Right? What happens when it senses low oxygen? What's it going to do? Release the erythropoietin, Right? Get the, uh, red, get the red blood cells produced. It just does that. Low oxygen, it thinks there's no red blood cells. It needs to make more red blood cells because they're the ones that carry the oxygen. You understand this thought, right? You have to think the way they think. That's how you, that's how you figure things out. Think the way the organ thinks. Even though it may not sound logical to you, think the way they think. Remember, you only defeat your enemy by knowing your enemy. Right? Like the coronavirus, you have to know it, <laughs> defeat it. If you know, we don't know it, we can't defeat it. Doesn't that make sense? Yeah. So that's how we're doing it. Understand the way the body works. Okay? So, um, so that concept is understood now? 
respiratory acidosis versus alkalosis. Now this gets very complicated also. I'm giving it to you in a very simplistic way, but it can get very complicated. Okay, the numbers can get very complicated. Um, so is there anything else that I need to talk about? I talked about the chart, we talked about the lungs, we talked about the cell type, we talked about the way the, uh, the, way the uh, pneumocytes work, right, in the, in the alveoli for, with surfactants. And I want to also talk about surfactants uh, with newborns. What is the situation with newborns when you give birth? Remember, the lungs are the last thing to work when you're giving birth. They're the ones that are not working in, when, when the baby's ready to be delivered, that's the only organ that's not working yet. Okay, so we gotta get the, as soon as the baby is born, we gotta get the lungs to expand. So the, lung, the baby has to have surfactant in its lungs because they're collapsed, right? And when they pop open, they have to stay open, right? Well, that's why it's so hard for them to breathe that first breath of air. It's very difficult for a baby to do, but they do it because we make them cry. We make them cry. Now, we don't slap them anymore. We, 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 we I, I ever tell you how I do it? I put the baby between my the legs, the feet between my fingers, and I rub his spinal cord. I rub the spinal cord, and it stimulates the nervous system. And the, and the, and the nurses, <laughs> suckling the mouth, making sure that everything's out of his mouth, and then the baby starts to cough. <laughs> That's good. I like to hear that sound. Okay, if I don't hear a sound, I'm still rubbing. I'm just gonna make a fire out of this kid. <laughs> I'm still rubbing. And, they, and you know, and then when there's a problem, then we have to do other things, and then the, the pediatricians there will take care of it. The OBGYN doctor will take care of it. And, um, you know, sometimes that happens to me. Sometimes. Um, so, uh, so the surfactant in a premature baby that's below 35 weeks of age does not have sufficient surfactant. So we have to give the mother steroids before giving birth. And, uh, and that, will, that will augment the production of surfactant because it's a steroid base. And uh, <clears throat> if, uh, if it's below 35, if it's... After 35 weeks of age, then we don't, uh, weeks of uh, pregnancy, we don't have to worry so much uh, because the baby's gonna have the surfactant. Uh, if the baby doesn't have any surfactant when it's born, for some reason, then we give him the synthetic, we give it to him as a, as a, as a drug, and we'll inhale it, and that's what keeps babies alive. Believe me, there was a time when premature babies did not live, and it was only about the surfactant, and we know how to make the surfactant now, so we can actually, cause that baby to live. And babies can be born now up to what? 27 weeks, 25 weeks of, a, of birth. My God, that's almost half the pregnancy. And um, you can still keep the baby alive and there's still viability. And uh, you know, it's dangerous, but still it can happen. But there was a time when 35 weeks was, was terrible. We couldn't keep the babies alive after, before 35 weeks. But now we've figured it all out and thank God for that. So it's easier to keep them alive now. Um, so, uh, are there any questions about the pulmonary system? Have I forgotten to mention anything? Um, let's see, now inhalation. Oh, and by the way, um, when we inhale and exhale, what is the, do we need energy to inhale and exhale? Well, the muscles contract, right? So inhaling is, you're using some ATP, right? The diaphragm's contracting, so you need ATP for that. And when you relax, you also need ATP too, right? But when, you're, but when you're dying, if you ever watch TV, do we need energy to exhale? No. Well, because when you're dying and you're dead, <coughs> it all comes out. The breath comes out. You understand that? It comes out. Because what's inside the lungs, and this is what I wanted to talk to you about, the lungs have a cavity. And this is a cavity. So there's a pleural cavity around each one of the lungs. That's what I'm going to talk about. There's a pleural cavity around each one of the lungs. It's a sac. It's like the pericardial sac and around the heart. There's a pleural sac around the lungs. And there's a space between them. Because so this is the lung. This is the space between the pleural. And this is the thoracic area. Now there is negative pressure inside the lungs. Because you know that. Because if you ever stab somebody in the lung, it collapses. Yes, a pneumothorax it's called. When the air gets into the cavity, it's called a pneumothorax. 
If you're bleeding within the cavity, that's called a hemothorax, where blood is, is filling up with air, is filling up. But there's negative pressure. Negative two inside the lung, negative four on the pleural cavity, and negative six on the outer thoracic area. And when we breathe in, we're increasing the tension. So this gets to negative four, this gets to negative six, and this gets to negative eight. You understand that? And when we breathe out, we want to recoil this sucker. So easy to do that, to get it to normal, because we're almost like filling up a balloon. And now we have to, and the air comes out very quickly, doesn't it? Doesn't the air come out quickly? Because you're increasing the tension inside the balloon. So you're letting the air out. Very easy to do that, right? Easier than breathing in, isn't it? So understand that part as well. The negativity of the thoracic cavities is negative pressure. Remember, the pressure out here, 760. The negative pressure inside, that's why we need, and remember, positive and negative charges, there's so much positive pressure out here that the negative, the small negative, it wants to come in. So it's easy to come in. It's easy for the air to go in. All we need to do is just elongate the lungs a little bit and make them expand well, and it can do it, and without a problem. Uh, but uh, uh, sometimes um, when, the, uh, when the pressure here gets a little abnormal because there's fluid in here, or something is going on, and it's more difficult to breathe in, and also the, the, the alveoli uh, sac is filled with fluid, so it's harder for the, for the passive transport of oxygen and, and carbon dioxide to go through. So it's harder to breathe. So we like to give these people positive pressure so that we can get that air in. You know what I'm saying? These people have problems with their pulmonary system, so they need to get air. And when you don't have air, you can't do anything. So that means when you have heart problems, you can't breathe. So you, because the heart and the lungs are together. If you have a heart problem, you can't breathe. You have problems breathing. And you can't walk. You can't do anything. When you have lung problems, you can't walk. You can't do anything. You understand that? If, uh, having respiratory problems and heart problems are you're incapacitated. You can't breathe. You can't move because your muscles need oxygen. That's why you get people that walk around with oxygen all the time. Because they need it. They can't get that. And, and anything above 21% is a drug. When you take oxygen, that's 22%, 25%, 50%, 100% oxygen, right? It's toxic. You know 100% oxygen is toxic? It becomes oxygen radicals and can, just, and can hurt your, your eyes, especially your eyes. You can't use it that much. I used to use it for a second. All of a sudden, I'd be like this. Better than any drug I've ever seen. Oxygen, 100% oxygen cures fatigue. Cures it. I'm always tired. Take a little shot. <laughs> you feel good. Go Pure oxygen is fantastic. Love it. We give that to 100% oxygen to people with stroke, right? People that need the 100% oxygen for people that can't breathe, we'll give it to them. You understand that, right? We need them to have that energy because ischemia or hypoxia can damage organs, especially the brain especially the brain. Brain tissue is very sensitive to ischemia, and that's like saying hypoxia, low oxygen to the area. And when the brain doesn't get oxygen, what happens to the brain when it doesn't get oxygen? It gets tired. That's why you get tired. I always tell people, take a deep, when you wake up in the morning, take five deep breaths of air in the morning. Before you get up in the morning, before you actually lift your legs and go to the bathroom, Take five deep breaths of air, you'll feel better. Your brain will wake up better. Uh, it's exercise in the lung expansion. You gotta do it. I mean, I don't do it all the time, but I think about it a lot. Taking deep breaths of air is very, very important for your everyday living and everyday function. When you're tired, take five deep breaths of air. You won't be as tired. Take another five deep breaths of air. You'll get less tired. It's your brain that's tired, not your body. Your brain is tired. It doesn't have any oxygen. Get it some oxygen. Buy the tank. <laughs> you can freaking uh, go, you can go to the moon. So anyway, um, is everybody clear on, on, on respiratory? It's a very cool subject. Does everybody enjoy themselves? Mm -hmm. <laughs>